Hey, what's up, everybody? I wanted to make sure to pick a book that was special for my 50th book review, and after finishing this one, I can say, yes, it definitely was. And I also want to say that I really want to hear what you guys think about this one, so I'm going to be asking you at the end of the video. This is Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History by Stephen J. Gould. This is a book that appears on many essential reading lists, particularly those for biology and history. So who is Stephen Jay Gould, and what is the Burgess Shale? Stephen Jay Gould was a paleontologist, and he wrote a number of best-selling science books. His Wikipedia page says that he was one of the most widely read science authors in his age. He was known as a great professor of paleontology, but he was also known for having some ideas that didn't always go along with the thinking of his day. Sadly, he lost his life at the age of 60 to cancer. So while I may not always agree with his ideas that he comes up with, there's no denying that Stephen Jay Gould excelled at giving us things to think about and things to talk about, and that is perhaps best illustrated in his book, Wonderful Life. The Burgess Shale is a fossil quarry up in the Canadian Rockies of British Columbia. What makes the site so significant is the array of soft-bodied Cambrian-era fossils preserved there. Fossilization is rare enough, but the fossilization of soft parts is much rarer, requiring very specific conditions. And as, as if that wasn't enough, it's from the Cambrian explosion over 500 million years ago. Besides just being such bizarre and alien-looking creatures, the Burgess Shale fossils are widely regarded as the most important fossils ever found. That means more important than T. rex fossils, more important than Archaeopteryx and Tiktaalik fossils. But to really appreciate the significance of the Burgess Shale, let me see if I can explain it. The Burgess Shale was discovered by Charles Doolittle Walcott in 1909. When Walcott tried to classify these fossils, he simply shoehorned them into already existing taxonomic classifications. Shoehorn is the word repeatedly used by Gould in the book, but it turns out Walcott was totally wrong. Walcott's error was discovered decades later when Canadian paleontologists Harry Whittington, Simon Conway Morris, and Derek Briggs re-examined Walcott's fossils. It turns out that most of these fossils didn't belong to any known groups. The correct classification of the Burgess fossils caused us to reevaluate our ideas of how evolution works and did work. The prevailing thinking at the time had suggested a steady increase in diversity, which can be imagined as like an upside down cone. But the Burgess fossil fossils show the phenomenon of decimation. Normally, Decimation means to take and kill off one in every ten, but in the case of the Burgess Shale, decimation took and killed off nine in every ten. This means that every body plan we see today had to have evolved from that surviving one-tenth of Cambrian creatures. So nine-tenths of the unusual and incredibly diverse creatures of the Cambrian never got to pass on their DNA. Gould says, quote, one quarry in British Columbia, no bigger than a city block, contains a disparity in anatomical design far exceeding the modern range throughout the world. End quote. Let that sink in for a moment. If everything we know of today came from a tiny fraction of the biodiversity of the Cambrian, just imagine the staggering diversity there would be today if the remaining nine-tenths of the Burgess fauna lived to have ancestors. Gould goes on further in explaining that this decimation had nothing to do with the adaptive traits and anatomical distinctiveness of the creatures. Just like the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, the factors determining who lived and who died was not reproductive fitness or adaptability alone. It was largely due to chance. The environmental catastrophes that caused different extinctions throughout history didn't care how well adapted each creature was. One example Gould has used to illustrate this point was that you could be the most reproductively successful fish that ever lived, but if the pond dries up, you're finished, it's over. <laughs> One more quality of this book is that it manages to just keep getting more interesting as you go on. Gould says multiple times that if we could somehow replay the tape of life and watch history over again, 
we would likely see a completely different outcome. Maybe some other freak environmental occurrence would kill off some other life, sparing different creatures that did die in our timeline. A point Gould raises, which I thought was particularly interesting, was that for over half the time that life has existed on the planet, it was prokaryotic life. Eukaryotic life has been around for less than half of the time of prokaryotic life, and the factors which gave rise to, rise to eukaryotic life came down to just plain old chance. We're incredibly lucky that life didn't just stay prokaryotic for another couple billion years, and it wasn't something that had to happen. The fact that it did was a matter of chance, and a very slim one at that. The way Gould makes this argument is much more interesting than how I can put it. It was one of the more intriguing parts of the book, and there are a lot of them. He then goes on to say that we could replay the tape a thousand times and humans would not emerge as the dominant life on Earth. Not only that, but you cannot predict which creatures will survive and which ones won't. He's basically saying that chance plays a more significant role than the natural selection of the life forms themselves. The implications of this are pretty far-reaching. This goes back to what we were talking about when I reviewed the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. A freak catastrophe takes out certain groups, leaving vacuums to be filled by other life. Well, what if things happen differently? What would we see if we could replay the tape? Another interesting point Gould raises is the selection of the creatures who are responsible for the creation of coral reefs. Their competitors could just as easily have lived and we may never have had coral reefs on our planet. Again, that came down to a matter of chance. So a huge chunk of this book is just taxonomic descriptions of the bizarre Burgess fauna. And while I promise that this is much more interesting than it sounds, in fact, it was some of the most interesting parts of the book, it turns out that Gould was withholding the most interesting creature for the last three pages of the book. Of all the strange creatures we read about, Gould finally reveals Pekaya, the oldest known chordate. So a chordate is an animal that has a notochord, which is an anatomical structure destined to evolve into the spinal column. That's right, Pekaya is an ancestor to humans. And if this little creature would have been part of that nine-tenths of the Cambrian creatures who didn't make it, we wouldn't be here. And of course, nothing about this creature would have enabled anyone to predict that it would have been, been one of the ones to survive. It was just chance. This book was a really fascinating read, and for me it was a long time coming. The book also has terrific illustrations by gifted science illustrator and museum exhibit creative consultant Marianne Collins. These are pictures lifted directly from the book of some of the Burgess fauna. This is Anomalocaris, the largest and predatorial uh, creature. This is Opabinia with its five eyes and its grasping appendage. Sydney, another predator. This is Hallucigenia, a strange looking thing. This is Morella, the most common uh, creature in the Burgess fauna. Didn't survive, neither did this top predator. This guy right here, Ashaya, I think may have been the only one that survived, and nobody could have ever predicted that just the way it turned out. So there are also a bunch of camera lucida drawings from the other paleontologists mentioned earlier, as well as, as, well as photos of the fossils, and it really is fascinating to get a look at these creatures. And despite the validity, validity of each of Gould's assertions, he is a very talented and engaging author and teacher. You feel like you're attending his lecture while you're reading this. He'll say things like, make sure you commit these terms to memory. I mean, I never thought I'd be so fascinated by arthropod anatomy. Though his writing can be a bit dry at times, Gould really does a good job of relaying the material and keeping the reader interested in the conversation. This is an important mark of good science writing, and not everyone can pull this off. So now then, now that the review is over, I do feel like I want to say that some of Gould's arguments I thought had some holes in them. I mean, this book is not the first time I've heard Gould make assertions that can be refuted. He is, after all, the guy who came up with Noma, or non-overlapping magisteria. You can look that up if you want. First of all, if we could replay the tape, 
to assert that things would happen differently would mean that you would have to change things in the environment too. We could go back a billion years, but the factors responsible for the asteroid ending up impacting Earth and killing the dinosaurs are still at play. Rewinding the tape doesn't change that, nor would it change the factors that killed the nine-tenths of Burgess fauna that died, catalyzing a chain of reactions that would give rise to Homo sapiens, whether or not it was predictable or due to chance. And as far as his example of the pond drying up, well, fish have been known to evolve the ability to leave the pond, and octopuses too. That's something that happens, and I think we need to factor that in if we're going to be making far-reaching statements like that. So, based off of what you've heard here, what do you guys think? I mean, really, do you think that chance plays a significant role in the development of life on Earth? If we could replay the tape, would things go down in a completely different way? I really want to hear what you guys think. Have you read this book or any other Stephen Jay Gould book or heard any of his arguments? I'm curious to see what people think about this guy. Okay, guys, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. I really do hope you guys liked the video. And I mean, thank you for watching any of my videos. It really does mean a lot to me that anyone would watch any of these. And it certainly wouldn't be as fun if nobody did. So what kind of science books do you guys like to read? Are there any specific areas of interest you guys have? This was a good one, guys. And if you want some very interesting things to think about, make sure you check out Wonderful Life by Stephen J. Gould.